Hey. Hey everyone, I'm Philip. Um, I don't want to imply um, that there is no security, that question mark at the end is very important because sometimes this gets cut off and that is, that is not the message I want to convey. Um, did anybody get ransomed in kind of like with one of the NoSQL data stores? Anybody? No? Okay. You've been lucky, I guess. Um, so let's dive a bit into security and what is going on in that regard. Um, so I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, but I'm generally running a meetup about databases. So I'm, I'm interested in all things SQL or relational database and non-relational database. And security is one of the more interesting ones in that area. Um, so I guess a lot of you know that dbengines.com, which is kind of like the Tioba index for databases. And this is the current version of that. So I'm picking three systems here that top three NoSQL systems I'm taking, and then I'll take a quick look at security in each one of them. So those are MongoDB, Redis, and then Elasticsearch. So let's see what we can do here. I guess everybody is familiar with little Bobby tables. Um, so the nice thing is if you don't have SQL, um, you don't have SQL injections, right? So it's much more secure, <laughs> assumedly. Who, who thinks that is true? Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm afraid I have bad news. Um, but let, let's see. Um, so let's talk about MongoDB. Um, I guess everybody's familiar with MongoDB. They're the web scale database. If you still remember that one where um, whatever, the, the two guys are talking to each other uh, in kind of a computer voice. And one is always asking questions and the other one is responding. And the response here is whatever you're asking about MongoDB, their answer is always web scale. Um, and, and then there's this other thing. Um, they recently had their IPO. And then people were like, oh, awesome. Um, it's, it's not only that you can lose your data now, but also, um, yeah, your money. Um, anyway, so let's talk about injections. Um, do you think injections are a thing in MongoDB? Who thinks injections are a thing? Yeah, that's, that, that's a good guess. Um, maybe you still remember Diaspora. I don't know how many years that was ago, like five, seven, I don't know. Diaspora, the idea was to have like this competitor to Facebook, which was open source and kind of distributed, but it was still a social network. And they started hacking stuff together, I think, in Rails and with MongoDB. Um, however, later on, they discovered um, social networks are a very relational problem, and MongoDB is not a good fit for that. So they redid that. But their first iteration had MongoDB in there. And one of the things they had in the code was that they had these uh, match queries where they were just passing in uh, random strings. And that was not a great idea, because that is the classical injection you can get with any anything. Um, and since they have JavaScript in the back end, well, you didn't have SQL injections, you had instead JavaScript injections. But it, it ended up as the same thing. Um, so these are kind of like the functions you might want to be aware of. Uh, if you use these and take any random scripts or any random user inputs, uh, you have a nice JavaScript injection in your data store. So yeah, no SQL injection, but you have the JavaScript version of that. Uh, you can disable scripting in general because there's always a discussion, should a database even be able to do scripting? If you think it does, um, you can actually escape all the code blocks uh, to avoid these uh, injection problems there. But otherwise, you can just turn off scripting and avoid the problem altogether. Um, yeah, and then this ransomware thing took a hold, basically. So back in 2015, a German university found lots and lots of MongoDB instances which were not secured. And everybody said, well, that's not a good idea. Somebody could look at the data, but it doesn't really scale, and nobody can really make money easily out of that. And people didn't really care about that. So while the universities were saying, well, this might be a problem, do something, people said, well, I don't really care. And then it took like two years until people figured out how to make money out of that. Um, because then suddenly you had cryptocurrencies, uh, which have like anonymous transactions. And then people figured out, well, we could do something there. Uh, and the general idea is um, you download the data, um, you store it somewhere, you delete the data from the live server that people have, and then you offer to give them the data back if they pay up. The problem is, from what I've heard, a lot of people don't actually take that backup of the data, because A, it takes a lot of time, and it also needs a lot of bandwidth and storage. So they just delete the data and ask for the ransom. And if you get your data back, it's always up for questions. Um, but yeah, that's the general idea of what people did. And that hit MongoDB pretty hard. Um, who thinks that MongoDB is binding uh, to all interfaces by default? 
Yeah, they used to do that for a long time, but it changed. Um, so at least with the uh, latest version, 3.6, they changed it for all distribution mechanisms. Before that, it depended a bit on how you installed MongoDB. So if you were using their apt or uh, RPM packages, it was disabled by default. But if you compiled it yourself, uh, there was no standard configuration, and it would bind just to any interface, and wherever it was reachable, uh, it would happily accept any connection. Uh, but they changed it now. Um, I guess a lot of people complained, so... Yeah, that problem has been solved. Um, do you think authentication is enabled by default in MongoDB? Anybody? No, 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 it is not. Who thinks that MongoDB has any authentication and authorization mechanisms? Yes, they do. Actually, they are pretty good. Um, so authentication and authorization is one of the strongest points of MongoDB, at least for the NoSQL ecosystem, because you always build a new product, you want to get users. Security is kind of like the the stepchild which always comes afterwards. You need to have like production users and only then security becomes like an important point. Otherwise, you don't care that much. You just want to get started and claim to be web scale. Um, but MongoDB actually is pretty good in that regard. You just have to enable that. By default, any authentication authorization is disabled. So in the configuration or if you started on the command line, you always need to pass that off through. Um, otherwise, you're not really secure. Um, in earlier versions, they had their own implementation, uh, which was a challenge response thing. Um, in more recent versions, they switched to uh, SHA, uh, Scram SHA-1. Uh, I think Postgres recently, but only in the most recent version, switched to uh, SHA-512, so kind of a very similar implementation since it's an open standard. Uh, it has a lot of cool features, uh, like both sides need to authenticate against each other. It's, it's an actual standard. Uh, you can check the implementation. Uh, so that part is actually done very well. And they even have a lot of predefined roles. So whatever you need to do, there's probably a predefined role you just need to activate. Um, and then everything works as expected. Or you can just say, OK, security, that is kind of done. OK, next or final thing is SSL has been included in most of the recent versions now. I think some special builds for some platforms don't include SSL because it's kind of harder to include there. But generally, they have SSL everywhere. So that is actually MongoDB. Even though they have been or had the most ransomware problems, their security is actually very strong. Uh, next up, talking about Redis. Anybody using Redis? Yeah, I thought so. Um, anybody happy with the security Redis is providing? Let's see. Uh, does Redis bind to all interfaces? Yes. Who, who thinks yes? Um, OK. That, it does. Um, they have this special thing now um, called protected mode. Um, and protected mode is actually very clever. Um, so it was added in a rather recent version, or not that long ago. But what it does is, by default, all queries coming from localhost will do the right thing. Every query coming from remote will answer to the query, but it will only answer back, like, you need to set up this correctly. Like, they don't have this that they don't, or kind of cut off remote connections. They allow remote connections, but will only tell you what to do or how to configure it. So that is kind of their approach, how to make stuff easier to get started with, um, which I think is a kind of interesting approach. It's just if you have, like, anything that is exploitable, uh, binding to all interfaces by default is kind of questionable. But otherwise, from the usability point of view, that's an interesting trade-off. Um, yeah, they have some kind of authentication. There is no authorization. Um, their own documentation says it's kind of a tiny layer. And you know, if your own that documentation says it's a tiny layer, it's probably really small. Um, so what they have is you can set one password for the entire system. It's stored as plain text in the Redis configuration, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and there is no rate limiting, and there is no uh, encryption involved. So if you want to encrypt anything, you will need to proxy that yourself. And the problem with no rate limiting is the point of Redis is that it's very fast, and it's a key value store. So you can do a lot of queries, and you can also try a lot of passwords that way. Um, so if you want to make sure nobody's trying to brute force your passwords, either watch that or pick a very, very good password. Um, the other very interesting thing that Redis does is hiding commands. So what they have added is uh, you can set them in the Redis configuration, and it will need a restart to get them back. But what you can do is you have a con command name, rename command. And then if you say, I want to rename the config command, you can just give it a different name. And only if you know the different name, you can actually call that command anymore. 
Um, some people use kind of like a hashing function to, to do that and then figure out automatically uh, how the command is called. Um, others just keep track of that. That is pretty much the security by obscurity approach. You just hide the name of a command and only if you know the right name then you can change stuff. But it's kind of working. The other approach they have is you can even hide commands entirely. So if you say um, rename command uh, and say config has an empty string, you just will not be able to call that function at all anymore. It's just kind of gone from the system. And they actually recommend to do that for production systems, I think, for three different functions, like drop all the data in Redis, uh, which you normally don't want to do on a production system. They actually recommend doing that for the data store. Okay. And finally, don't enable Lua scripting or don't pass in random functions uh, to the Lua scripting because that's the classical injection again. Everybody has that who supports scripting. Um, finally, Elasticsearch. Um, does Elasticsearch bind to all interfaces? Who thinks yes? Yeah, not anymore. Uh, we changed that, I think, in version 2. Uh, which is already at least two years ago, uh, that has changed. So we are not binding to all interfaces anymore. Um, are we still broadcasting to all the nodes on the local subnet? No, we stopped doing that. Um, the main thing was that that was a very cool feature. You just start one node on a subnet and then another node somewhere else on the subnet and they will find each other automatically. You don't have to do anything, um, which was cool. Um, I know when I did trainings and everybody started one node on their laptop, they would form one big cluster. But you could also see the problems back then because somebody would write in some data and somebody else would delete some data. And it was pretty much chaos. And the worst case scenario people would have at some point is when they VPN to their production system and they have Elasticsearch running locally. Uh, and then it connects to that and forms one big cluster and you think you'd run one command locally. Um, that is a very bad day. Um, it, it only applies if you keep the default cluster names. You should always change those. Only then will you form one cluster. But it is something I'm sure that happened to people, so um, we stopped doing that. Um, yeah, can you run Elasticsearch as root? Anybody thinks that? We get complaints about that about kind of like once a month because Elasticsearch, when you try to run it as root, it will just system exit and it will not run. And now with the rise of Docker containers, a lot of people want to run stuff as root again. Um, and we are arguing about that like once a month with somebody. Um, and I always call this idea the cockroaches. Like, it's something that you think has been kind of like, you got rid of that in the past, but it's still there and it's not going away. Um, yeah. And then there is scripting. Um, if you had security issues with Elasticsearch, there was probably a good chance that it was around scripting. So these are all the, the security issues we had in Elasticsearch. And you can see out of those six, um, three were related to, or seven actually, um, three were related to scripting. And kind of like the worst ones, they were all around scripting because, well, we thought adding a general purpose scripting language like Groovy is nice to add a lot of features. And it's very quick to get started with that. Uh, problem is, securing a general purpose language is super hard. Um, so we added a new language which is called Painless. Um, the story is the developer of that has chronic back pain and he just wants something that is painless, and that's why he called it like that. And we kind of want to take the security pain away. Um, so we hired a developer. Um, he has been working on that for a year, um, and then people ask, like, why would you create another scripting language? There are already that many out there. Uh, however, we had kind of like the specific design goal. We want to have something that is secure and performant and has just the right feature set for us. So we thought it was the right trade-off kind of to develop our own painless scripting language and security and performance were the goals. Um, just to give you a quick idea, this is how this looks like. If you have like that uh, absurd operation where you either uh, create something with a value of one or you increment the value, that is how you do it in Painless. Language uh, looks pretty familiar. Um, yeah, and Painless is the new default. And let's see if we can do that in 40 seconds. Um, normally I try to do that live, uh, but if you know, um, uh, Shodan, it scans the internet for open stuff. And this is actually how ransomware attacks works. Uh, they just look like who has an open, uh, an open Elasticsearch instance. And then you can query that and you can actually see this instance has already been ransomed because um, please read. Let's take a look what is in please read. I will tell you, um, yeah, we got your data. Pay us 0 0.5 Bitcoin. Though um, I have recently seen, uh, since the dollar price or the, the Bitcoin price is fluctuating so much, um, 
Yeah, they have switched back to US dollar values. Um, and with that, I think we're out of time. The only thing you need to be aware of, sometimes different people try to ransom you, and then somebody takes your data, and you, somebody else then takes that data, and you would need to pay each one of them to get kind of like back to the original who took your initial data. So that is not where you want to be. Um, thanks a lot. <laughs>